took the Iranian reading public by storm in 2005. Though not the first novel to become wildly popular in Iran, this was a historical or purportedly historical fiction, not a particularly common or popular genre in Persian literature or Iranian cinema. I speak of Kimia Khatun, Dastani as Shabistan Molana, written by Saeed Eqots, a first time author at age 54. She indeed claims the book to be based upon extensive research, though given the paper-thin and flimsy nature of the historical record, this seems a trifle hyperbolic, indicative of an urge to market or make the work more urgent by its verisimilitude. Indeed, the author's somewhat imperfectly Englished website confesses the truth. Even though excruciating effort has been put into telling the story exactly as it happened, scarcity of resources had made, has made this work truest imaginary image of Kimia Khatun's life. Indeed, the documentary evidence contemporaneous with Kimia's lifetime can fit on a single page, about six sentences, most of which do not contribute to a coherent narrative alluding to her only glancingly. There does seem to be a story there, but what the plot might be exactly cannot be clearly outlined other than to say that it involves Kimia, who died in 1246 or 1248, the famous Shamsuddin of Tabrizi died after 1248, Alaeddin died circa 1262, and the latter's renowned father, Jalaluddin Rumi, Mevlana, died 1273. Two other sources written down perhaps three generations later do provide sketchy memes or data points, but give tantalizingly little information about her, much of it hagiographical in intent, with all the typological and symbolic features and polemics in which this genre engages. Kimia in the sources of the 13th to 14th centuries is mentioned only in passing as an incidental, one-dimensional character of interest only because she figures to some, in some anecdotal stories about the disappearance of Shamsa Tabrizi from Rumi's life and plays a quasi-explanatory role in the mythology surrounding it. But the truest story our novel purports to tell about Kimia does not even conform in several of its major premises with these few modern reports, pre-modern reports. Although Anna Marie Schimmel took an interest in the women folk in R Rumi's life and made the first attempts at cataloging the Masnavi's concept of woman and women, it is not a topic that has been often or systematically engaged. In the scholarly literature about Rumi, there are only scattered references to Kimia. And though individual women in Rumi's life are briefly discussed in this biographical and exegetical literature, there is no sustained or comprehensive analytical discussion of the role and status of women generally in the circle of Rumi and his immediate disciples that would help to contextualize the symbolic, semiotic, and narratological functions that Kimia Khatun in that early in the early sources which mention her, namely her husband's quasi-diary and two somewhat later hagiographies. The few works that devote attention to describing the women of Rumi's household do so mostly without analysis. There is a non-scholarly work written by a female devotee of, Mev of the Mevlevi Circle in California that lists the names and a biodatum or two of the women in the proto-Mevlevi Circle. A 2006 monograph in Persian by an Iranian scholar, Woman as Revealed in the Works of Molavi Rumi, focuses rather on pertinent passages in the poems of Rumi and the hagiographical literature that illustrate his literary orientation toward woman or women. One 2008 paper in English appearing in an academic journal tries to remedy this situation somewhat, but in summarizing what is known about the women in Rumi's family, it becomes indiscriminately mired in the pre-critical views of the hagiographical tradition. There is also one study of the body tales of the Masnavi, through a Lacanian lens that attempts to establish a theoretical hermeneutics of eroticism and sexual symbols, which also touches glancingly on the notion of women as conceptual category and or historical women in Rumi's life, but not in a particularly clarifying manner. Hence, a space existed and a need was felt for an imaginative casting or recasting of the relationships between Rumi, Shams, and women in their circle through a fictional feminine gaze. This is the historical perspective Saeed Erbots tries to imagine in Kimia Khatun, though, uh, sorry, through a socially embedded group in Rumi's circle who are not 
argumentatively looking on things with a feminist gaze, but are looking with a woman's view through a story that is at least 90% fictional. The book seems to have been something of a lark or a thought experiment for its author, who has published no other book before or since. However, the novel rapidly sold out, and as of 2009, 1388, had gone through at least 18 reprintings, selling at least 60,000 copies, which makes it one of the better selling novels in Iranian publishing history. Kimya Khatun was also translated to Turkish by Vesel Basci as Mevlana Jalaluddin Ruminen Paramindan Kimya Khatun uh, in 2007, and more recently into English as Rumi's Daughter in 2011. It had been earlier turned into an unpublished screenplay, working title Rumi's Kimya, by the founding figure of Iranian new wave cinema, Daryush Merjui, with Merjui angling for Golshifte Farahani in the role of Kimya, though the project funding remains as yet unsecured. Surveys taken in the US, Canada, and Britain suggest that men account for only about one in five readers of fiction. I have yet to read any serious study of the gender demographics of Iranian fiction reading, but women do read fiction, perhaps in greater proportions than men in Iran, and several women novelists stand out among the acknowledged bestsellers of Iranian publishing history. Simin Danishvar Savushun in 1969, Fatane Haj Sayed Javadiz Bamdad Khumar, 1998, Zoya Pirzad's Chera Haraman Khamush Mikonam in 2002, and Zoya Pirzad's Chera Haraman Khamush Mikonam in 2002, uh, and now Saidi Qutz's Daughter of Rumi, uh, 2005. And while I have no statistical evidence about the specifics of the readership that has, been, that has made the fictional tale of Kimya Khatun or other novels about a woman protagonist, my hunch from anecdotal observation in social fora such as goodreads.com is that women may form a majority of the readership and that this reading is often uh, socialized in the form of women's book clubs or reading circles. But regardless of the precise gender demographics of reading in Iran, Kimia Khatun reverses the male gendered gaze, the dominant vantage point from which the Sufi tradition generally and the circle of Rumi's teachers specifically view the world, religion, and the spiritual path. Uh, as such, Gotz's fictional character, Kimia Khatun, returns a regendered gaze that looks back from a vantage point of critique viewing with implicit accusation an Iranian, perhaps an Anatolian, and a Sufi patriarchy that is complicit in thwarting the realization of Kimya's, the fictional Kimya's desires, and beyond that in creating systemic inequality for women. It recalls perhaps to an extent Virginia Woolf's thought experiment about Judith, Shakespeare's hypothetical sister, in which, however, the creative outlets for the fictional Kimya would be not time and a room in which to write, but love and self-determination over her own affections. The novel gently calls into question the behavior of an uh, icon, perhaps the icon of Persian spirituality, Jalaluddin Rumi, often received and represented as exponent of an expansive and ecumenical Iranian form of Islamic <coughs> mysticism and personal relation to the divine in opposition to a more narrow, doctrinal, and restrictive set of clerical concerns identified with the theological state. The basic plot of Kimya Khatun, the novel, concerns a younger girl in the extended family of Rumi, purportedly his stepdaughter, through his second wife, Kera Khatun. The novel is divided into two parts. The, the first, wholly imagined, in which the protagonist is not greatly discontented. Kimya somewhat fancies Rumi's older son, Allah Adin, from his first marriage to Gohar Khatun, and he seems to return her affection. After the arrival of Shams in Konya, Shams hankers for Kimia, and Rumi's devotion to Shams leads him to capitulate to Shams's concupiscent interest in Kimia and marries her off to him, though he is old enough to be her father. It is thus a Lely and Majnun-like tale of patriarchal oppression, a classic pre-modern love triangle in which the older man gets his way over the woman he desires and over the younger man who desires her. In this iteration of the triangle, the younger man, Allah Adin, is constitutionally unable to challenge his older rival, Shams Adin, but nevertheless succeeds in rousing his jealousy, which Shams then takes out on Kimia, losing all affection for her and turning her resigned and cultivated contentment to disappointment and eventually death. The historical evidence for Kimia's life is so slight 
as to tempt us to consider her as a symbolic foil, a character with a Hawthorne-esque and conveniently allegorical name, Lady Alchemy. Saeed Irvod suggests her version of events is based on research she did in the shrine or tomb in Multan, Pakistan, dedicated to Shamsuddin Tabrizi, a shrine that has no historical association, known historical association with Shams, and where Shams is most unlikely to be buried, since he has other burial sites in Konya, Kui, and in Tabriz. <coughs> the jealousy and anger of Shams toward Kimia, though not the physical beating of her, can find interpretive support depending on how one construes the sketchy allusions in the six scattered and largely indecipherable mentions of Kimia that Shamsuddin himself makes, occurring in the Gosas de Pareha sections of the Movahed edition of Shams's Ma'balat, and in three small anecdotes in two 14th century hagiographical sources, namely Shamsuddin Aflaki's Man al Tabal Arafin, the Acts of the Gnostics a record of oral lore circulating in Konya between 40 to 80 years after Rumi's death and collected without comment about the reported anecdote's authenticity. There is also Sepah Salar's Resale, or treatise about the early Mevlevis, dating to between 720, 1320, uh, but in any case before 739, 1338, although the later sections may have been completed by a second hand and extend into the 1750s, uh, 1350s. Sepah Salar, who claims to have served as a disciple of Rumi's circle for 40 years, is generally more discriminating in his reportage than Aflaki, though both pertain to the Ma'af al or Man al genre and purport to present not so much the earthly history as the spiritual feats, the symbolic intervention in the phenomenal world of saints connected to the invisible world. I've described the problematics in reading these sources for historical detail elsewhere in my roomy past and present, east and west. For the present purpose of reconstructing a history or an attitude about the role of women in Rumi's life and circle, we may only add that the sources of reports are varied and include anecdotes attributed to female members of the extended household. And while the attributions are often dubious, some could well have been transmitted largely in female circles for two or three generations before being recorded by Afla, or Sepa Salar. In this regard, it is worth noting the death dates of some of the significant female figures in the circle who are re reputed to be the transmitters of these uh, anecdotes. Kera Khatun, Rumi's second wife, died in 1292. Malake Khatun, Rumi's daughter by Kera Khatun, in 1304. While these reports must be used very judiciously, a systematic study of them might allow us to make some interesting observations and intimations <coughs> that while not necessarily hysteric, <laughs> historical are nevertheless less novelistic and imaginal than what the novel Kimi al Khatun presents. I might add, add that another reason for belaboring the point of the source material for the novel is that the popular discourse on Molana Rumi seems largely resistant to scholarly correction. And even among scholars, information which has been disproved or discounted, such as Molana's father's supposed fame in Balkh, continues to pass for historical factoids. This is unfortunately true of the one previous article in a Western language which attempts to describe some of the women of Rumi's household, credulously and inexplicably using the fictional account of Saeed Ghots as evidence for the life of Kimia and Shams. 